How about now? Okay. <clears throat> wow, that's weird. <sighs> anyway, what I was trying to say was, sorry for the technical difficulties. I've been having, um, well, just today, I don't know, so, so many weird problems with the computer, but hopefully everything's okay now. But welcome to the Sunday live stream where we talk about photography and check up on how everybody's doing. And I hope everyone's doing well. Happy Easter. Um, thank goodness, you know, spring is here or just around the corner and the weather is just awesome. Uh, you know, we're, we're almost to the point where, you know, I prefer it like in the 80 degree kind of range. Uh, I don't mind 90s. 70s is great. Um, but, you know, when we're in the 50s and 60s, it's kind of that borderline for me where it has to be sunny out, then it's okay. If it's cloudy out, 50s and 60s still feels cold to me. Um, but anyhow, uh, I just, um, I, I, I'm so sorry for the technical issues. But let, let's see who's here. Let me just go in and, and uh, welcome everyone. I see Robin Schaefer, good to see you. And um, let's see, Ken Cox, Peter Hurley, awesome. George Mooring, always good to see you. And Wayne, uh, Marsha, good morning. I, I envy you living in Florida as always. I, I wish I could be there. Eric, always good to see you. Thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate it. Uh, <clears throat> and you have to go drive to Annapolis. Let me see this, uh, to pick up my son there. Then Sandy Point. Sandy Point, Eric is local to me, so that's why I'm getting all these details, right? Because otherwise I'd have no idea what he's talking about. But Sandy Point is a nice uh, little beach area that we have. It's along the Potomac River, or maybe it's the Patapsco River, but uh, I, I don't go there often enough because they, they, you have to pay parking to get in. I don't know what it is now, but when I went there six or seven, maybe 10, it's been a while. It's been at least seven years. Uh, it was like four or five bucks to go in. And I was like, screw that. I ain't, I ain't doing that. But, um, <laughs> uh, somebody's, uh, part of the bribery for her getting ready to fast, but I'll be listening. Her getting ready. Oh, her getting ready fast, not too fast. I thought you were talking about fasting, like, you know, not eating for a period of time. Um, and Annapolis, of course, is the capital of Maryland, the state that I live in. And I, I do go there time to time. I haven't been there in a while. But it's a, it's a nice uh, town similar to uh, Old Town Alexandria, where it's, you know, for relatively historic, right? There's a lot of buildings there that look very similar to the as they were when they were built a couple hundred years ago. Um, there's a lot of history in Annapolis as well. I should do a, another vlog there. I think I did one vlog there early when I started my channel, and that's probably the last time I was down there. Um, but, you know, history is relative, right? For us, a couple hundred years is like sort of back to the beginnings of when we started our country. And for many of you out there, could be thousands of years, like China, you know, they've been there forever. England, you go way, way back, hundreds and hundreds of years. People are probably still living in homes that were built like four or 500 years ago. Uh, so that's, that's why it's always interesting to see vlogs and videos in, in the UK or that whole European area, because everything looks so nostalgic and beautiful and everything's well kept. And that's what I really admire about, uh, a lot of other countries, particularly only because I'm familiar with the, the European area in the sense that they're, you're not ready to tear something down right away and replace it, right? Uh, you try to make use of what's there and, and make it last as long as possible. Here in, here in the United States, it's like, you know, commercialism just reigns supreme and there's very little hesitation to tear down a historic building uh, and replace it with some glass and steel type building or architecture. Or just, you know, just level hundreds of acres at a time and put up some warehouse or data center, you know. And it, it breaks my heart to see, you know, landscapes and areas where wildlife probably flourished to some extent just get pushed aside 
for the sake of, you know, um, progress. And I question, you know, if we really are progressing at all, <laughs> you know, because when we, when we, I, you know, and, and this has been said by probably every activist out there, but, you know, when we take away wildlife and nature, you know, we take away a part of ourselves. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I, I don't, I, I hope that there's more effort to preserve, you know, our natural landscapes and, and even, even man-made landscapes, you know, like in old town Alexandria, there is a concerted, there are some laws in certain towns where you can't tear things down, or if you do, you have to replace it with something exactly the same kind of thing. Because ultimately some things just don't last, right? You know, building fires and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not a historian by any means, but I do watch a few YouTube videos on history time to time. And, and it just always fascinates me how rich our, our, our world is, you know, anywhere in the world. Um, and, and all of the amazing things out there uh, that we can see and experience. And because we're in photography, we can capture those moments and share them with other people, uh, just like a lot of people do now. I wouldn't be able to experience the world uh, at all were it not for, you know, videographers and photographers sharing their work, you know, with the world. So I'm very grateful for that because Many of you know, if you've been following me a long time, I don't like to travel much, ironically. Uh, the, the thought of travel just, and I'm not afraid of flying and all of that, but just the thought of travel seems like a lot of overhead uh, to go somewhere and then come back, you know? I, if, if I had the opportunity to go somewhere for like a couple months and stay, maybe I would be more inclined to do it but it's just not feasible. It's just not feasible for multiple reasons. Uh, but just going for a week or, or a weekend, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't interest me at all. <clears throat> Anyhow, uh, let me see. Gordon is here. Happy Easter. And um, hopefully the audio is good now. And I see John follows and uh, Robin Wong. Happy Easter. My goodness. How are you? So glad you can come into my stream. I'm sorry I don't make it to your streams quite as often. Um, but I do watch them later usually. Usually I watch them later. And you're doing such a, a great, great job. I mean, I, I really envy the, the, the enthusiasm and the energy that you have during your streams. I mean, it takes me like two cups of coffee just, just to get started, you know? And then while I'm in the stream, I have another cup of coffee or tea <laughs> uh, just, just so I can stay awake and, and semi-alert. And let's see, oh, Jose Alberto is uh, from Spain. Good to see you. I, I would like to go to Spain. Spain and Italy and, um, you know, all the European countries. I'm going to do it one day. I will. I know I don't like, you know, I've said I don't like to travel, but if I can, it, it might, it might have to be, it's going to be a while though, before I can do that because I have Ellie. Um, so maybe seven more years, <laughs> God willing, I'm still alive by then. Oh, Gordon in the low twenties, John Thomas in the cold UK. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're funny. Happy that, um, it is April first over there, isn't it? You're you're like a day ahead. That's funny. There, there's no Pen F two. Are you kidding me? Um, I will talk about the Pen F a little bit today, though. And uh, here in Southeast Florida, condos are put up on every available piece of land. It's disgusting. I know, right? It's just terrible. Um, you need a lens mug for your coffee for extra. Oh, I see. I do have uh, three lens mugs, okay? And it's been said that you're not a photographer until you have 10 lens mugs. I mean, you're always gonna buy one for yourself anyway, but you should get like lens mugs from people that know you as gifts because they don't know you have one already. Because <laughs> I, I, when I got my third one, she gave it to me. She says, I hope you don't have one of these already. 
And I said, I'm so grateful for this mug because I'm on my way to being a real photographer because you're not a real photographer until you get at least 10 of these. So if you can't find 10 people that know that you're a photographer and get you a mug like that, you're not a photographer. <laughs> and she was, she was so happy and relieved that even though she gave me something I already had, that I was still extremely excited and grateful to get, get such a nice gift. Uh, because like, like a lot of things in life, there's, there's certain things that uh, just have more meaning to them than their actual face value, right? They have more meaning to you uh, for whatever reason. And it's, it's, um, it makes it, it makes it special nonetheless, even though to somebody else, you know, it's the old saying, one man's trash is another man's treasure, right? Or one person's trash is another person's, uh, treasure. So, um, yeah, uh, I'll try, I'll try drinking out of a lens mug next time and see if that helps. <laughs> uh, I do use the lens mug time to time when I go out. Gosh, I, I haven't literally left the house until yesterday. Uh, I did make one little 30-minute run to the grocery store to get some supplies, you know, food, uh, in two weeks. It's just, I, I just haven't been able to leave the house. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons for that, but uh, next week's not much better. I'm not, I'm not really going to be able to get out until Thursday. Um, so hopefully everything works out. But yeah, Thursday will be... Oh, you use the lens mug to hold bits and pieces for the PC. That's cool. Um, a Cuban cafe. Oh, interesting. I wonder what that is. Must be extra strong coffee. Oh, hey, it's Oltan. Good to see you. And uh, let's see. John says, uh, my son, his partner, and their dog moved to the U.S. last weekend, landed in New York, and drove to Austin, where they are hoping to settle. Wow, Texas. That's awesome. I, I went to Texas. I've been to te I lived in Texas uh, for about six months uh, in El Paso. I think Austin's more in the central state, but uh, or I don't know. My geography is terrible. But then I went to visit Texas again. I went, I think I went to Austin, actually. But what I remember about Texas, and this was at least, this was probably 20 years ago since I've been to Texas. Uh, but I remember it was extremely dusty. Everything was so dry and dusty. And um, I, I would be afraid to live there because you'd be dusting your house every day. Uh, crazy. And they had these, there was these, all these little uh, swirly mini tornadoes or wind swirls and, and the little tumbleweeds would go up into the air like 100 feet all the time. When I, when I lived out there, I remember as a kid, probably wasn't 100 feet, but when you're, when you're only that tall, right, everything looks really high. And I remember uh, lizards were very common. You know, I used to catch them as a kid and, and whatnot. But yeah. Texas. Um, I have to go back there someday. It's very humid in Austin. Really? I lived in San Antonio for a couple of years and found that heat and humidity in the summer terrible. Wow. I some okay, so maybe I didn't go to Austin. I and I remember there was a bar, or not a bar, but a restaurant that I went to, and it was called Dick's. Right. And uh, the waiters and waitresses that that place was known for uh, treating you very rude. Right. But it's a very popular restaurant, but you get treated like shit there, basically. Um, I mean, literally, the waiters and waitresses will be cussing at you. I don't know if that place is still there. If anybody lives in Texas and knows if that restaurant is still around, it's called Dick's. Uh, they would cuss at you and and they would bring your plates over and just throw them on the on the table, you know, not gently and nice and everything. And and you know, I mean, 
ultimately the service, right? The time, not service, but I should say the time, timing was very good, right? Everything was on time. Food was excellent. Um, and uh, whatnot, but um, yeah, that, that, was, that was an experience. And you go there for that experience. You go there to be treated like crap, okay? <laughs> I mean, I think I think if I lived there, I'd probably never go there again personally. I don't I didn't I didn't like that experience. I mean, I it didn't upset me or offend me, right? I mean, I was I knew what I was getting into when I went in there, but it just wasn't for me, right? I'm just like Yeah, this this was an interesting experience. I I'll do it once. You know, I'll I'll do, I'll do almost anything once, you know. I up until about 10 years ago, I would do anything once. But now I'm a little older, I'm like a little smarter. I'd like, I'm never gonna do skydiving or those other kind of crazy bungee jumping, things like that. That ain't happening in my life, the rest of my life. But uh, yeah, oh, Dick's Last Resort. Okay, is that what it's called? And um, you think they're still around, okay. Interesting. Hi, Clint. Good to see you. Thanks for coming in. And uh, lots of funny Facebook vids about. Oh, really? Okay, I have to check it out. You know, it'll bring back some memories from being there. Um, interesting. They were. You heard the restaurant was on Food Network. Okay. Wow. Very, very interesting. And Verma said, I would try skydiving without a parachute only once. <laughs> you know, hopefully you don't survive it though, right? Because I've heard people survive like when their parachute fails to open. It's not pretty. And uh, Lee is asking here, I was trying to use the OM Image Share app to control my OM1 in live view mode. It appears the video recording mode only allows 4K 30. As 4K 60, yeah, that that is the case, and I think uh, someone asked the same question. Maybe it was you on uh, one of my videos, and I responded that yeah, that when when you're connected via Bluetooth Wi-Fi with the app, it's limited to 4K 60 uh, or 4K 30. I'm sorry. Um, so far, as far as I know, I, I don't think there's any way around that. Because it, it forces, as soon as you open up the movie mode, it forces you into 4K 30. And I don't know if that's because they're trying to uh, manage the bandwidth between the camera and phone. Or if there's a limitation in the hardware uh, where they they can't do 4K 60 even if they wanted to. You know, whatever the technical reason is, I don't know. But right now, it's it's not possible. And uh, crazy hot in Malaysia. Yeah, when I went to Mal I went to Malaysia. For those of you that don't know, uh, wow, that was probably fifteen years ago. I need to go back there one day. But uh, I I loved it. I didn't mind the heat at all. It was it was fine. Um, maybe because I was only there for I was there for about three weeks roughly. So maybe it was fine, you know, because I like warm weather to begin with. But maybe if I lived there, it might be different. I might get tired of it, right? <laughs> it's, all, it's always relative. Um, oh, that was me in the other video. Didn't, oh, okay. No big deal. No big deal. I'm glad, I'm glad I could help. Uh, so... All right, so I guess let me talk about the the pen F. <clears throat> Raman says the heat wears down on you. Yeah, um, I I bet it would. I could imagine, uh, but it it just I don't know. I remember hiking in ninety degree weather, and it was about a seven or eight mile hike, which isn't bad, except it was in the mountains, so it was a lot of hills. And I, I will say I was a little bit worn down then. This was in my younger days when I was a lot more fit. Uh, it did, it did wear me down, but 
<clears throat> anyway, that, that, oh, hold on, Catherine, good morning, whoops. Good morning, I'm wondering if you can use the internal intervalometer on the OM1 to shoot continuous bright, no, you cannot. You cannot mix uh, uh, features like that. I think there might be one you can mix, but bracketing and intervalometer is not not doable. Uh, someone else asked a very similar question uh, last week, and my suggestion was to use the uh, use this. This is a Pixel uh, Pixel Pro TW two eighty three. I have a video on how to use this, but what you could do is set up an external inter intervalometer with one of these and set the trigger to only fire every, you know, three or five seconds. However, it depends on your exposure time. But what it'll do, it'll, it'll push the shutter button. And if you have your camera in bracketing mode, it'll fire off, you know, however many brackets you set up. So let's say you do a three bracket shot, plus or minus two EV. Uh, that would only take about a second to, uh, fire those three shots given you know normal exposures and uh and then you need about one second to clear the buffer or the uh right to the memory card now no on one you'll probably never hit that buffer okay but just for the sake of good practice or best practices you want to you want to double the time of the shutter right to the time to write to the the memory card so if you take three shots and those three shots take one second combined or less, you want to add one second for time to write to the memory card. So you're going to set the intervalometer for every two seconds on this. Now for longer exposures, right, if you have like a 10 second exposure and plus or minus two would be uh, 40 seconds and five seconds. So now you're talking about one minute and five seconds, right? So you'd have to set the intervalometer. In this case, you probably don't need to set it for two minutes and 10 seconds, but I would set it for, uh, uh, you know, two minutes still. I would still double it. And, and the reason for that is I'd like the sensor to cool down a little bit in between bracketed shots. Um, and this is all temperature dependent, but when you're doing long exposures, uh, heat builds up on the sensor, and then you start to get noise from the heat. So um, to minimize that, you know, you have these longer wait times between each exposure so that you can reduce the amount of noise. Because what you don't want to have when you do long exposures is have the long exposure noise reduction turned on. You want to turn that off generally uh, for long exposures and deal with the noise in more conventional ways, either letting the shutter cool down or do it in post-processing. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's a thousand different scenarios that you would do different kinds of settings, but ultimately the, the logic here is use an external envelometer and set your camera to bracketing and do it that way. Okay. Uh, Gordon says not an OM, but considering a GX 85, <clears throat> but comes with a panty 12 to 32 and 4150 small and light. Um, Virtually new, albeit 2016. Any thoughts? <clears throat> yes. Um, I had the GX85 and the 12 to 32. And then I, I didn't get the 45 to 150 because I have the Olympus version. And I compared it directly to my Pen F, which is a comparable camera in terms of features, etc. You know, just technically they're about the same. Uh, they each have their own specialties, you know, special features like 4K photo mode, but Pen F has, um, you know, the, the color wheel. Anyway, um, <clears throat> the, I found the GX85 didn't focus quite as fast in low light against the Pen F. And the Pen F is probably the weakest autofocusing Olympus camera or modern Olympus camera, like anything that came out from 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 when the Olympus Pen F came out and forward, uh, it's the weakest. Uh, not a big deal, but I did miss focus time to time in very low light when I was doing some street photography and comparing the two cameras. 
uh, with the same lens. I didn't, you know, I swapped lenses and, and tested it that way. And I found that, so if you're thinking about doing low light street photography, I would have a little bit of pause using the GX85. Uh, Cause you're gonna have to be more deliberate in your focus points or your targets, right? You wanna make sure you're targeting high contrast points in the scene that the camera can bite into and, and lock focus. Aside from that, and that, that should not be a deal breaker in my opinion, because it's very, very minor difference in the autofocusing capability between the GX85 and any other contrast-based detect sensor, uh, which meaning it's very, very good, point to point, very fast. Uh, but if you wanna split hairs, it was the weakest in low light. But uh, putting that aside, the GX85, is extremely well built. I love the design uh, in terms of its handling, button layout, the menu system, um, the, the build quality, it's all metal. It feels solid in your hands. And that camera, uh, I, I, I regret selling it, but I, I, I sold it among many other cameras to get my 300 millimeter F4 Pro. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but that is that is a really excellent camera um and I, I i you know i wouldn't give you any pause except for that one issue that i found compared to my pen f that is Greetings from Maine. Still loving the M1 Mark II. Always surprised to hear of other brands being sent for repairs. Mine has been banging for seven years, no problems. That's awesome. Yeah, Olympus, uh, you know, the, the Olympus cameras are awesome. They they are, my, my pen PL8 has been banged around. The, the screen is bent and not it's not broken. It works, but it's bent and it won't close all the way because I've dropped it so many times. Um, but it still works great. And this is why I think this this is another thing that uh, that reminds me, you know, I was looking at I posted a video on my community channel or on the community page on my YouTube channel about somebody posted a video about the ergonomics of the M10 Mark III. And of course, that would translate as well to the M10 Mark IV, about how great the ergonomics are. And this is really true of all the Olympus cameras with respect to the button layout and the usability. You can tell, despite the numerous comments to the contrary, I can tell that these cameras were designed by people that love photography. And they, you know, unlike Sony, Right, I'm sure there's many photography enthusiasts within the Sony, you know, department that develops or designs cameras. But something about the Olympus cameras, you can tell it was definitely designed <clears throat> with a lot of thought throughout the development process for photographers. Um, just like Panasonic's, there's a lot of thought that went into for videographers. Olympus has always been very, very thoughtful about a lot of the things on the camera for photographers. And they're, they're just very subtle things, things that uh, don't make the check checklist, right? You know, they don't check boxes. Did you know that this is a lot easier to do on the Olympus camera? And, and you know, it escapes me an example that I can give you about why I think that's the case. Um, but when I'm using the camera and I'm going through, I'm like, that was smart. That makes sense. That makes this much easier. And this is what I can say when I use the Olympus cameras is that the workflow in the field when I use an Olympus camera is very smooth and very intuitive. And I have very little trouble uh, doing getting the camera to do what I want it to. Now, I know the menu system has gotten a lot of complaints over the years. And it's because they just pack so many things into the camera. I will say that whoever developed the menu system were not photographers. Okay. Uh, those were probably gearheads, right? Or, or 
keyboard, what do you call them? Uh, keyboard monkeys, right? They, they, uh, they're really good at coding and, and developing apps and software and stuff, but they did not work closely, I think, with the uh, team that developed the overall design and ergonomics of the camera because the layout doesn't make a lot of sense sometimes to me. It's still better than my Sony camera, way better than my Fuji camera, not as good as Panasonic or Canon. Canon and Panasonic have the best menu systems, in my opinion. That worked with my brain, right? Now, when I go into uh, my Olympus menus now, I'm like, you know, no problem, right? Because I know it inside out. But it's not, the, the menu systems are not wired to uh, how normal people's brains work. It's not intuitive. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, yeah, so the new menu system is a little better. They re remodeled it so it's more like the Canon menu system. It still needs some work though. And I, I can give you a specific example on that. Uh, I brought the OM-1 off. I took it off the tripod so I could show you guys, just in case I wanted to show you guys something today. And now, now I got, now I have a reason. Um, but let me see if I can get this to, okay, you see the top layer here? You know, the camera one, camera two, AF, movie. And then underneath that, you have the page numbers, right? So page one, operations, and then, you know, you just kind of scroll through each individual page. So those of you that have the OM-1 know what I'm talking about, are familiar with the menu anyway. That top row should be numbered. Should be camera one, camera two, and then number three, whatever that was, the playback. They should have a number. See how it says camera one and two there? So it should be AF3, movie four, playback five, cog menu six, wrench seven, and then my menu doesn't have to be numbered, right? Even though the my menus are actually numbered, it's ironic, right? The one thing that really doesn't need to be numbered is numbered. But uh, because this, this is the biggest problem I have is, Especially when I'm trying to explain something, I'm like, okay, go to the cog menu. And people are like, what the hell is the cog menu? It's the one that looks like a cog or a gear. So some people say it's the gear menu. Some people call it the cog menu. Some people call it the setup menu. But then the wrench menu, the wrench menu is more like the hardware menu, right? And then the cog menu is more like the settings menu. It's, it's very confusing to, to, to explain or describe where to go in the menu system when these are not numbered. So they should have numbered these at the top. So I can say, yeah, go to menu three, page two, line five. That's where you'll find the setting. But right now I have to say, okay, go to camera setting number two. That's a little bit ambiguous, right? But what I mean is go to go to this one, right? Go to number two here. Or go to the AF menu. Pretty straightforward. I can say go to the AF menu. Then go to page three. Then go to line five. And then go to option three. You know, something like that. But anyway, that should that, that top row should be numbered. So I'm not saying cog and wrench or settings, you know things like that because it is it gets a lot more confusing when you when those things are not numbered and you got these and uh it starts with an a the word and am, am, ambiguous <laughs> god got the entire english language for a split second ambiguous icons there right uh so anyhow had some great visits to Austin, Texas. Great brisket, even at Costco. Wow, that's awesome. I I need I need to travel more. I should do a road trip. I say that all the time, but I I, I don't like to leave my house empty for more than a day, because um, we got this squatter problem. 
here in my neighborhood, okay? I'm not talking about na nationwide. It's kind of in the news a lot now about all these squatters, but uh, I know in my own neighborhood it's a problem. So, yeah. When when I when I move to my next home, it's going to be a condo or something or an apartment that I have a lease, so that uh, I don't have to worry as quite as much. Uh, because you can only have one person on the lease and you can't sublease it. Or if you have a condo, you're paying condo dues and you can't sublease sometimes the condos uh, in particular communities. But anyhow, uh, I until the laws change. Okay, so let's see. Um, It's weird, my, my chat jumps back to the beginning sometimes. And Vermin says, I still have my GX8085, especially when I stop trying to force it to be a wall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cam cameras, you know, every camera has a purpose, right? Um, so thanks. I do have a Velo shutter bot center velometer. I'm still figuring it out. Can I customize the amount of bracketing myself or am I limited to the options given? No, you can, you're, you're limited by the menu, but there's two different bracketing options. There's the HDR menu, which is bracketing in bigger steps. You can jump two steps, three stops, I think. Uh, and then there's the normal bracketing menu, but you're limited to what's in there, right? And that's... That's the only other suggestion I've I've said many times in my streams uh, that the bracketing menu is makes no sense to me. It should be you set the number of frames, you set the number uh, the differential of the um, the exposure, right? So if you want plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus three, that should be a different setting than the number of frames that you take. Uh, not too dissimilar. They do this already in the uh, uh, focus stacking menu, right? In focus bracketing. You can set those things separately. You know, the focus differential and the number of frames. You should be able to do that in the bracketing menu. It makes it just makes more sense to me than having these limited, limited number settings. But yeah, it's limited. <clears throat> and... Oh, hey, Marco, how are you? Ha happy, happy Easter. It's good to see you. Marco, Marco is, uh, and I, you know, I'm so grateful to Marco. He's been so generous to me over the years uh, with various things. Um, like m most recently, he gave me this uh, bracket uh, base plate for my OM1, which I greatly appreciate. Uh, it's this one here. He sent this to me as a gift. They, you know, you know, it actually came with a nice little um, card. Let me show you. Um, I meant to show this to you last in the last stream, but it came it came with this nice, nice little card. Uh, and I, I'm gonna frame this. For now, I just have it kind of just sitting back there on my shelf. I'm gonna frame it though because. You know, these, these kind of things just mean a lot to me when when someone sends me a gift and a nice little note. Uh, it says, uh, I haven't been able to find any generic base plate, but no, you'll use and like this one. Just a small token of appreciation for everything you do for the community. So, yeah, so this, this is very special to me, right? Um, so thank thank you, Marco. I, I really appreciate it. And um if OM1 not on a tripod today, what is? OM12? I'm not sure I understand this this question. Oh okay. I mentioned I took this off the tripod. Uh, right now the tripod is uh it would have the OM5. I think that'll probably be what I replaced. Right now, the tripod doesn't have anything on it. But I have the, not the OM5, I'm sorry, the EM5 Mark III is. So th those are my two main cameras that I use uh, here in my home studio. 
which is just my dining room. I use I use primarily the OM EM5 Mark III with the kit lens. And more recently, I just put the OM1 on there uh, with the 25 because I'm doing some portraits and stuff for another uh, review I have to finish. And uh, the, the the eye detect on the OM1 is so good. The face eye detect. I was missing shots because it was relatively low light, and I was missing shots with the EM5 Mark III, given the lighting that I had. So I switched to this, and it was like, you know, the OM5 is the OM1 is so good with face and eye detect. When you bring the you know in lower light, I, I know Robin has trouble in very low light, but with the lighting that I had, the OM1 was working great. Uh, and uh, Marco says you're a good, good egg, Rob. Can't believe you saved that. Yeah, I save all kinds of little tidbits. You know, some things I just take a picture of because ultimately, you're just your house is going to be one big giant full of scrap scraps, right? <laughs> like a giant scrapbook. Uh, I'm trying to digitize a lot of my paperwork so I don't have to have so many drawers full of paper. Because ultimately, you know, once it goes in that drawer and filed, I never look at it again. It's extremely rare, except like five years later, I'll be like, oh, I need that piece of paper for something like my birth certificate or whatever. But usually when it goes into that drawer, I never look at it again, but I can't throw it away because it might be something important, right? Like a tax record or something, a receipt. Uh It's true. The OM, I would say it's true. Uh, they they may have they they claim they've done done some redesign that enhances the strength of that base plate in the OM five. But ultimately, people are still having the same problem that they did with the M five three. And this this brings me back to the other thing I wanted to talk about when I was talking about that EM ten mark. Four and Mark III video about the ergonomics of that camera. You don't hear people really complaining about the tripod mount breaking because a lot of people using the EM10 Mark III and IV are not putting heavy lenses on that camera, right? They're usually, they buy the kit lens, maybe the 40 to 150 kit, and they're done. At least I haven't heard too many reports. I haven't heard any reports of the base plate problem with the EM10 Mark III or IV. And those are the same plastic body cameras as the EM5, EM5 and OM5. Um, and that's, that's the difference between people that, people that buy these cameras. People buying the EM5 Mark III and the uh, OM5, these are serious enthusiast cameras. And people are going to start, you know, they're going to buy heavier lenses. They're going to use it in more rugged situations, right? Uh, you know, they're going to buy the Peak Design accessories usually. So these cameras are going to be exposed to things that are tripod related, that tripod mount related, more than, say, the EM10 Mark IV. Most people on the EM10 Mark III and IV, they're not, they're not putting it on a tripod. They're just, it's going around their neck or in their pocket, whatever. So I think that's why there's so many more reports of this problem on the EM5 Mark III and IV. Uh, because of how they're used differently in the kind of per people that buy the OM5. And that's why in my last stream I talked about they really need to go back to an all-metal body if for nothing else than to uh, solidify that base plate and also give the camera that sort of premium camera feel, right? Uh, so th those are my thoughts on that. I think I, I hope I hope the OM5 Mark II will be in all. I doubt it, but I I can we can all hope, right? That it's has they they reincorporate at least the base plate and the top plate to be metal. The middle can be all plastic with a titanium shell or something inside, not shell but skeleton, right? A titanium skeleton. But the, the outside, we just need more metal on it. And then I think people will, people that buy it, it may not sell more cameras uh, to the masses, but, but for people that are already enthusiasts of the Olympus OM system cameras, 
I think they'll really appreciate that because there's nothing worse than really somebody that loved Olympus OM system cameras then come out and say, yeah, this camera's not so great, right? Because they've gone the plastic, they're, you know, the bean counters have come in. You know, for them to lose their enthusiasm over a camera system because of the build quality. Because uh, the capability has always been there. It's inside the camera, but build quality is the first thing people see and touch on a camera, right? Then they get into the specs. And this this is so important, you know, to uh, particularly all people that are already in love with the camera, the OM system, Olympus cameras like myself, the look and feel and build quality of the camera, you don't want to see it take a step backwards. And, you know, people can argue that it's actually a step forward and everybody's using polycarbonate, you know, reinforced plastics. And and the OM5 is a very solid plastic camera. It's, you know, it's, if, it's kind of similar to a screwdriver handle, right? And in tools, a lot of tools, have plastic handles, but they're very, very strong plastic, right? So the OM5 has that sort of feel to it in terms of plastics, but it's it's no substitute for the feel of a metal built camera. Uh, you know, if nothing else, just make the base plate metal, you know, and eliminate all doubt about the strength and rigidity of the OM systems cameras. Uh, perhaps someone knows I want to use Pure Raw 4 and then import the image to Capture One Pro between the options to say DNG or TIFF or PR2. Which format has more details? I'm not familiar with the PR2 format, uh, but DNG and TIFF are virtually identical. Uh, TIFF, TIFF is sort of like the TIFF, TIFF, uh, all right, DNG is probably the, the choice to use if you're going to import into another photo editing software like Capture One because it, it preserves most of the camera access data and some, some additional data that TIFF does not. TIFF, however, uh, is going to give you a larger file because it's uh, more linear. <clears throat> and I'm kind of getting a little bit outside of my, my knowledge here, right? I'm, in terms of file formats and things. But what I do know is TIFF is sort of like the original raw image, meaning, or the original raw format was TIFF. And then we got into NEF and CR1 to, you know, the Canon RAWs, the Nikon RAWs, Olympus RAWs. Every raw format is based off the original TIFF uh, format. But then they figured out how to, um, make it nonlinear, where they're able to store data for all three colors into a single byte, rather than making a whole byte for each color. They could use one byte to store all three colors. And that's all I'm gonna say, because that's we've, we've gone just a little bit over what I know about file formats and stuff. But DNG has is the most compatible in terms of Lightroom and Capture One being able to read all of the camera access data more so than TIFF. So I would save in DNG, but you're not going to lose image quality anywhere across the board uh, in DNG or TIFF because they're both raw formats. They store the raw data. They just store it differently. So don't be deceived by the TIFF file being larger than the DNG file. Okay. The TIFF file, and you have to save in 16-bit TIFF. Because our Olympus OM system cameras save in our 12-bit RAWs. Most, most cameras, a lot of cameras are 14-bit RAW. But you want to save in 16-bit TIFF. And DNG is by default a, a uh, standardized RAW format that saves in, in a, not in a linear fashion. That's why the files are smaller than TIFF. But there's no difference in terms of resolution or quality or dynamic range, everything is exactly the same, regardless of what format you save in. Um, and, and some have talked about saving a 16-bit TIFF gives you more latitude in post-processing. And that's true to an extent, uh, but 
the original raw data is the same. You're not actually adding more information to the image from the raw data. You're adding more information from the editing software that wasn't there to begin with. Um, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but I'll, I'll move on. But don't, ultimately, there's no difference. Uh, Angela, happy Easter. Good to see you. Thank, thank you very much. And Zoltan, always good to see you. Zoltan is like the, the icon king. I don't even know how to make an icon in the text and chat message, messages and stuff. I don't know how you guys do that. And, uh, and then here's some more, some more info here. Somebody that knows more than I do, I hope. <laughs> TIFF and DNG should be equivalent. DNG digital negative is made to be like a source negative back in the film days. Yeah. Yeah, they should be the same. Digital negative, I think, was the, the DNG format was developed by Adobe, if I recall correctly. Uh, and that's why it has, you know, specifically for ca digital cameras. Whereas I think TIFF, TIFF may not have been originally for digital cameras. But don't quote me on that. But DNG was definitely developed for digital cameras, and that's why they have a more structured uh, uh, exit data format. Now, DNG is no replacement for the native RAW formats that are in your cameras, because the native RAW formats in your cameras, like the dot, um, what the heck is our extensions on <laughs> ORF, right? Our Olympus RAW file. The .orf or .nef, whatever your raw format is that's proprietary to the camera, that raw file, while the image data itself is the same, there's no difference between that and a DNG file. So same image quality, dynamic range, etc. The proprietary raw files have more proprietary information. So uh, the easiest example is in a proprietary raw file, you can save information like where is the exact focus point that the camera focused on, right? That is saved into the proprietary raw files. If you use a very specific profile to your camera, like in the PenF, if I use the art mode number two, pop art number two, that'll be saved in the proprietary image <clears throat> of the raw what exact picture mode I was using. Versus in a DNG, you're not going to see that information. You might just see uh, sRGB, you know, what color profile did you use? Not necessarily what color profile did you use in the camera. Um, okay. Yeah, DNG is huge, but TIFF is huger. Yeah, like I said before, don't, don't let that, don't let that uh, give you the impression that TIFFs have more information. They do not. It's just the way the files are saved. If you're saving in 16-bit, you're saving much, a lot more, a much bigger file because it has to accommodate for 16 bits versus DNGs are going to be saved at the bit, bit rate that the camera saved it in originally. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. So my PenF... I went out with my pen app yesterday, uh, and um, I took this camera out three years ago to the same location, and now it's three years later, and this is still my favorite camera to take out, regardless of where I'm going. This is like my everyday camera, right? This is the one I want to take with me, and um, but I can tell you that since I started using the, the EM1 Mark III and now the OM1, more, more, more so on the OM1, there's a lot of things I, was, I missed when I was in the field yesterday. So let me, let me pull up just a couple of images. I won't bore you with my boring shots. My images are not, my photography is not all that great. So, uh, But I did want to talk about couple of things. So I was doing the, the bluebells are out, right? And 
I always get confused where the mouse is when I'm doing these. Okay, here we go. So bluebells were out. <clears throat> and for doing shots like this, the pen F is awesome, right? And uh, and this is what I did three years ago. I took, th th this is a shot, I believe, from three years ago. Uh, it was cloudier that day, so that's why this image is a little flat. And, you know, this is another image. This is an image the pen F is really not good at. In the sense that I have to up my photography skills to be able to capture a shot like this. Three years ago, there's no way I would have been able to capture a shot like this, unless I was lucky. This this year, you know, I've I've upped my skill set since then, you know, just through using the cameras all the time. I, I you know, I was pretty confident I was going to get a good shot of this bee flying, uh, you know, coming up to a flower. And I was able to do this with the Pen F, and I used the 75 millimeter f1.8 lens. Let's see what the settings look like. Oh, you can't see the settings, but uh, one one thousandth of a second. Oh, you know what? I didn't even use the 75. I used I used the 25 millimeter Leica lens. So I shot this with the 25 millimeter at f1.4, one one thousandth of a second, ISO 200. I dialed in plus 0.3 EV. That was probably by accident. Uh, but I was very deliberate about my settings in terms of the shutter speed. But my point here is that I, um, I, miss, I miss the joystick. You know, because on the Pen F, it only has the D-pad, so I was moving the focus point around with the D-pad. And now, it's taken three years, I guess, but now I'm really good at using this, this little joystick for moving the focus point around. And I miss that. Uh, and I wish I'd brought this camera now instead of the Pen F for the little photo walk I did yesterday with uh, the, the photo club. Uh, not only just for the joystick. Let me show you another picture. Um, I guess. I guess this is good as any that that one I had the first time. Um, Yeah, th this this one again. Now the Pen F has focus bracketing, but I would have liked to have focus stacking in camera, so I didn't have to process these when I got back home. This is not a process. This is just a single image. This is not a stacked image. I, I have a couple of images that are bracket or focus bracketed that I need to stack. I may not even bother. <laughs> Just it's just a lot of extra work, and ultimately the images aren't that great anyway. So why why bother? But uh, yeah, focus in camera focus stacking I kind of missed. And then one last thing, and we'll go back to this this B image. Uh, Pro capture Pen F does not have Pro capture, and. I, you know, there were so many shots I could have got with the OM1 or EM1 Mark III or whatever camera that has Pro Capture that I could never get with the Pen F unless I got lucky. So definitely Pro Capture and a joystick. Um, those, those were nice. I don't know why it rolled over to that image. That's just a sucky image. <clears throat> so. Uh, when I go back to this location, I'll, I'm going to try, maybe today, I don't know. But I'm going to bring the OM-1 because it has the in-camera focus stacking, it has the pro capture, it has the joystick that just make things so much easier. And this goes back to my original statement about this is, this is why the Olympus cameras, OM system cameras, I felt like were just designed for photographers you know, or designed by photographers or with a lot of influence from photographers. Because the workflow in the field 
is so easy, right? With these new cameras and with these features. And the execution of these features is outstanding. You know, a lot of newer cameras have these features now. <clears throat> but I can tell you, the execution, the Fuji and the Sony cameras have focus bracketing now. Sony now has focus bracketing. Fuji's had it a while. But they don't have in-camera stacking. And then also, uh, the Pro Capture, I don't think either one of my camera, other cameras have it. It might. I don't use those cameras to, to know enough to know. But definitely Pro Capture is extremely well executed. Uh, and now they all have joysticks, right? On them. Olympus may have been a little late to the game with the joystick action, but uh, these, these things just, I don't know. I, I, really, I really missed having the OM1 yesterday. I, I thought I could get away with just the, just, just the Pen F. And three or four years ago, the last time I went to that place, probably, even if I had an OM1, I wouldn't have done any better uh, because my skill set just wasn't quite there. But even, even now, three years later, with three more years of experience, uh, there, there are just some images that I can't do unless I have the OM1 because my skill set is not quite there. Because skill set and experience can replace any feature on a camera, basically. You know, any, any high end, high skill level photographer doesn't need pro capture or focus stacking. You know, they don't need joysticks. None of that stuff, right? They can they they could probably use a film camera and get better shots. But uh, for me, uh, yeah, the all in one definitely definitely makes for an excellent photographer's camera. Anyhow, um, Walter's in the house. Hey, Walter, how are you? We're gonna go. Uh, Walter and I is also local to me. We're gonna go for a uh, photo walk next weekend. April 6th. Um, you broke down and got the 90 millimeter yesterday. I know, right? I was looking at the 60 because Dave David Crooks let me borrow a 60 millimeter. I don't have a macro lens, ironically, for my Olympus cameras. But when I put my 60 millim put his 60 millimeter on there, my God, it was like so easy to uh get up close and get nice sharp images that that image of the bluebells was with the 60 millimeter macro that i borrowed from david um because <clears throat> i was struggling with the 75 and extension tubes and it's fine the best way to use extension tubes is with the 40 to 150 kit lens the f4 to f5.6 not the pro ones use the extension tubes with a 40 to 150 and you almost don't need a macro lens. You can get close enough for most things. It's no substitute for a macro lens. You're not going to get one-to-one, -one, right? But for the kind of photography I was doing yesterday, bluebells and stuff, it's more, more than enough with, with an extension tube and a 40 to 150. But that 60 millimeter 2.8 was like, I was like, wow, I was kind of floored by it. I didn't think I would be, but I was like, wow, this is really nice. And then, so I got home and I was finding used ones for around 300 bucks. And I was like, maybe, maybe. I, I can't really spare 300 bucks right now, but um, I was looking. And then, and then I saw the 90 and I saw used ones for about 1,000 to 1,100. And it's on sale now for 1,300. So I'm like, I don't really want to spend thirteen hundred dollars because I can barely spend three hundred. But if I'm going to buy a macro lens, I'm I'm at this point now in my photography where if I'm going to buy another lens, I want it to be the pinnacle of lenses for that for whatever purpose I'm going to use it for. And a ninety millimeter macro is definitely that lens. And it got me looking at uh, the 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 ninety millimeter. I think it's a 2.8 macro for Sony. It's a 90 millimeter G. It'll give you one to one, has image stabilization, weather sealing. It's basically the same thing. And it's and I can find used ones for around 700, 750 bucks. 
So I'm like, do I just, do I, do I get that instead of the 90 millimeter macro for my Olympus? Or do I just get the 60 millimeter macro and, and save even more and get effectively the same thing? Because the 60 millimeter macro on the Olympus is quote unquote 90 millimeter or 120 millimeter equivalent, right? So it it's it's costs half as much as the Sony version, full frame version, has the same aperture and uh, will have greater depth of field ultimately. So ultimately, it's, I think it's a better macro setup getting the 60 millimeter macro, say, versus the full frame 90 millimeter macro from Sony. So I kind of ruled out the Sony because it, you know, it, it when you search 90 millimeter macro, all these macro lenses pop up for all different systems. And I was like, ultimately, the 60 millimeter macro is the best choice and budget for budget macro. And it's not and for professional results, but it had a budget price, right? Because if you look at any other macro lens from any other camera manufacturer, uh, they're pretty pricey. The, there's a Tokina, I think, a Tokina 90 millimeter macro on sale right now for like $399. And that's very tempting. So if you don't own an Olympus system, the Tokina 90 millimeter macro is excellent and uh, cheap, you know, $399. <clears throat> and that's, that's kind of on par with the 60 macro from Olympus, but then it's going to depend on, you know, I don't know any other camera that has in-camera focus stacking like the OM-1. So I'm torn. Do I just hold out, save up for maybe later, you know, this year, I can buy the 90 millimeter macro? Or do I get the 60 millimeter now? I'm leaning towards just getting the 60 millimeter now. I don't know. Anyway. Uh, I need to work out flash settings. Yeah, if I get the 60 macro, I'll, I'll try and do some videos on that. You know, Michael Wydell, I think that's his name, has a great channel on macro flash, on macro photography, and he uses OM systems now and flash. But I think any flash video that he has is going to be uh, relevant to any camera system. So definitely check him out. Yeah, the 90 has the image stabilization and weather sealing, and it's a 2x macro, not a 1x, right? It does 2x. So that's what I was thinking is just... And you say, you think the reach of the 60 is the best balance, yeah. I know, because the 90 is not a small lens, right? relative to the 60. The 60 is less than half the size. So that's something I could just carry in my bag, and if I get the whim, I can just put it on there. And Tom says, I bought my daughter the Canon RF100 2.8 L macro lens, and she's getting fantastic photos. Quite happy with the sharpness. Yeah, I bet. Man, a Canon RF100 L? Nice. Um... I'm curious though, does the Canon stack in camera? Or do you have to stack those? I, I, I'm jumping the gun here. She may not even be bothering to stack, right? She's just shooting one shot at a time. Uh, but yeah, there's the, the lenses, the Canon lenses are so good. You know, they're L lenses. Um, everyone seems to be making great lenses. Um, Oh, wow. So Dobbs says the Canon can stack. So just to be more precise, stacking and bracketing is different, right? Bracketing is just capturing, say, 20 images. Stacking is taking those 20 images and creating one image, right? That normally you would do in Photoshop to blend those together. So just 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 let me know if, it, if it's actually stacking in camera. That would be that would be awesome. Yeah, but if it's not, then you just have to stack them in post-processing. Um, Canon cannot stack. Okay, so Jay's saying that the Canon cannot stack. 
Okay. Um, yeah, it's brilliant. Great bang for the buck. Yeah, bang for the buck, no question. I mean, brand new, it's on sale for like $3.99. And if my local camera store, District Camera, had one in stock, I would have one right now. Because I was going to leave the photo walk and go straight to the camera store and buy it. But they didn't have any in stock, which, which is a symptom, I think, of a lot of camera stores around, you know, around the world, maybe. But Olympus stock is very limited now, unlike it used to be very, very well. You know, I could go into any camera store and get, when I first got into Olympus, I could get any lens, any camera I wanted. Now it's like, you know, they only keep the most popular or whatever, you know, they don't restock. The camera store, district camera in particular, said they only restock, I think, once or twice a year, the Olympus gear. So once they sell out, you're going to have to wait a whole nother year before they get it in stock again. Uh, I think that's what he said. I think he said they restock Olympus OM system stuff once a year. And then once that sells out, they restock. And I get it, you know. Um, the, uh, you know, as a business, you have to manage your inventory because you don't want to be sitting on inventory too long. And uh, if if it's a low volume item, you know, you ordering once a year makes sense, I guess. And Walter, Walter's clarifying exposure bracketing is for dynamic range. Focus stacking merges for depth of field. True statement. If I misspoke earlier and mixed up exposure bracketing and focus bracketing. Uh, anyway. Olympus is a special order only at your local. Yeah. I know, right? It's like, it's it's unfortunate. The U.S. doesn't get quite as much love from OM systems as U.K., Euro, European countries. Okay, so... Um, that's really all I had for today. Uh, were those those two things, uh, you know, just some random musings and thoughts about my Olympus Pen F when I went out yesterday. The the BRAC, the the plastic EM10 Mark II and the plastic EM5 Mark III OM5 and the tripod mount. Did anyone have any questions or anything today? I'm open. I'm open to any questions right now. It's, otherwise, I'm just going to jibber jabber about myself <laughs> and we really don't want to go there today let's see don't see anything you guys it's quiet unlike robin's channel right it's like constant when he does a live stream i think see i was watching uh there was some there was something else I wanted to talk about. Now I can't remember. Maybe it'll come to me. But maybe maybe this is a good place to end if no one has any other questions because, like I said, I'm just going to jibber-jabber. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for coming in today. I really appreciate it. As always, uh, you guys have a great weekend happy easter and um oh <laughs> now the questions are coming there's always a delay right uh so i take all that back let me see if i can get to these uh, uh when's your next critique edit photo session it's going to be at least two weeks i'm not going to be able to do one this week i'll give some thought to doing it the following week my problem is um I'm still catching up on some product reviews that I have to get out and I, you know, I, I can't, my mind just, I, I've, I've started, at this point I've started turning all the product reviews down because they keep coming in. You know, I just do like, it's like, 
you do a couple of product reviews. I did a couple last year. I didn't do that many. I only did a handful. And then all of a sudden, like this winter, I'm just being flooded by them. And I'm like, okay, yeah, this is cool. This is cool. And I only try to take things that are kind of interesting or, or unique in some way. Like I got this light, this light, I'll show you a light. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to do a review on this light here. This thing is freaking amazing. Uh, this is a P something, P60 some, anyway, it's a 60 watt light. Uh, anyway, but yeah, so I, I got to catch up on some stuff. And this week, this week is kind of blocked out for some other things. Uh, I'll try, I'll try. I, I saw Camera Conspiracies at Casey. He's doing a lot of reviews, <laughs> photo reviews. His are pretty fun. Um, but yeah, sorry. I wish I could do those faster. Um, which camera is better, GH5 II or OM1? I guess it depends on your use case, right? If you're going to be doing video, GH5 II. If you're going to be doing photography, the OM1, no question. Um, if you need, if you need, because all in one is a good hybrid camera, video capability is more than good enough for 99% of use cases, even professionally. The GH5, though, I think is a very niche camera in terms of video because it's very high end video features that really only hardcore videographers and enthusiasts would appreciate. On the photo side, it has a lot of capability, but the lack of phase detect, you know, the autofocusing system doesn't lend itself to sports action wildlife as well as the OM-1. And the OM-1 is also uh, going to be more responsive for anything that has to do with photography. Uh, so I would, I would say if you're going to be doing 80% photography, get the OM-1. If you're doing 80% video, get the GH5. If you're... If you're doing 50-50, I'd probably still, it's kind of a toy cost. I would go for ergonomic size, weight, price. GH5 too, you can probably buy pretty cheap right now. So that's also a factor, right? Um, but bottom line is OM1 is better for photography. GH5 too is better for video. Will I be trying to shoot the um, Eclipse? No. I will not. Oh, and this is relative. So uh, bracketing. So it is bracketing and not stacking, but the R7 can stack in camera. I'm curious how well it works, though. You know, because I've, I've seen stacking in the Panasonic, and I don't think it's as good as the one in OM1, but close enough. That P60 looks cool, though. Maybe a pro yeah, I know it's really cool. This thing is weather sealed too. I can use this out in the rain if you want to. It's like a tactical flashlight, kind of, but it's bright red. Uh, yeah, look for look for this, because you know these companies. Now that I have a good relationship with them, this one is a GVM. I can pick anything I want out of their catalog, right? Such a such a luxury, really. <laughs> I can't believe they would send me anything I want. They're like, you know, look through our catalog, pick anything you want. So I could have picked like a, you know, $500 light if I wanted to, right? But I'm like, nobody's going to buy a $500 video light on my channel. And it's, it's a great light, but 99% of you don't care, right? But this... <laughs> This is not that expensive. It's on sale right now for like $180 or $170, which sounds like a lot, but if you know what this thing can do, that's not that's not that's a really good deal. And uh and I thought this was really cool. So that's why I kind of kind of got this instead uh of anything else. And the same is true for a lot of products now from other companies like uh, K and F, they they said just take anything you want, two of anything you want, <laughs> you know, just do a review. And I'm like, okay. And then um, yada yada. Anyway, so ultimately, these product reviews I've done, I hopefully you found them helpful, and and hopefully they have some value other than just about the product themselves. I try to do 
some tutorial or some real life use cases for the products, but um, <clears throat> I've kind of paid my dues now for these product reviews. My name has gotten out in whatever circle of people that that do the marketing that they can send a product to and trust that I'll make trust that I'll make a video about it. And uh, so now they're just sending me anything they want, anything anything I want. Um, I'm going to try and get another tripod in, but uh, I'm not sure. I, I have I I've had to turn down so many really interesting offers. Uh, one was for like this this other. Yeah, I showed David yesterday. You know, several of my emails that I got from these companies and my rejection let my rejection response. I'm like, sorry, I just can't. Sorry, my viewers wouldn't be interested. Sorry, you know, blah blah blah. I've turned down, I think at this point, more offers than I'm accepting at this point. So uh, I, I need to get through those. And I'll try and do some vlogs in between because the weather's a lot better now, thank goodness. And so I'm getting some ideas again. Now I'm feeling a little better. I wasn't feeling, I really haven't been feeling well at this past uh six or eight weeks so um hopefully i'll start feeling better after this week but all right guys uh i think that's um we'll wrap it up there david you just made it in there um Rob, robert let me just see robin schaefer says i've been wanting to get back into film photography I bought a Ricoh 500 rangefinder with a 45 fixed lens. Wow, $27. There are a number of decent film cameras out there for cheap. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, so many. You know, even the Olympus OM-1, OM-2 film cameras are cheap. Cheap, relatively speaking. Um, for an excellent, excellent camera. High quality. But... Uh, The last, the last light review you did way better than oh for that the uh, the X sixty. Yeah, I'll just say one more thing before I go, is that that video that Gerald did on the the X sixty light, um, he really did not have much enthusiasm in that video. Like he didn't put a lot of work into it like his normal videos. It just felt very routine, right for him. Uh, and I get it, you know, I have like checklists of things that I want to do in the video. Um, but that that video was so stock, you know, it just lacked any flair at all. I was really surprised because that's not like him. Normally his, his videos are very in-depth and he, he really gets into uh, a lot of different things. But that one was, yeah, I agree. That was that was not a very good video by him. Not Not up to his normal standards, I think. It just felt very stock, you know, like a stock product review video. Oh, but okay, you guys, thank you, Lucky. You have a happy Easter. You guys have a happy Easter, happy weekend. And I'll see you all guys again next week. Thanks for coming in today.